Jenny has presented to the doctor with complaints of increased thirst, a largely increased appetite, and very frequent urination. The doctor carries out investigations to check Jenny's blood glucose levels and finds that Jenny is suffering from type 2 diabetes mellitus. The first thing the doctor does is explain to Jenny how glucose is handled in our body. Carbohydrates form a key part of our everyday diet, and we all know that all these complex carbohydrates are ultimately digested and broken down to produce monosaccharides, mainly glucose. A very important enzyme, alpha-glucosidase is responsible for the formation of this final product glucose in our intestines. Now, the next step, as we know, is the absorption of this glucose from our small intestines into the bloodstream. But pause for a moment and consider this, when glucose enters circulation, the amount of solutes in plasma will increase, right? Meaning, the entry of glucose into blood will increase the osmolarity of plasma. In this situation, in order to maintain a balance in osmolality that is isotonicity, all the intracellular fluid would be drawn out from cells to plasma and we would be left completely dehydrated. But this does not happen. Why so? Because we have a very effective mechanism for handling the sudden rise in blood glucose level after taking a meal. Just before the glucose begins to get absorbed into the blood, we have a warning signal sent out to all the cells in our body, hold on to your water, glucose is coming. This warning signal is sent by a peptide known as GLP-1. GLP-1 is released from the intestinal epithelial cells and it quickly travels to the beta islet cells of the pancreas. Now, you must already be aware that the beta islet cells of the pancreas produce insulin. As soon as GLP-1 reaches the beta islet cells, it stimulates the GLP receptors. In response to this warning, the beta islet cells quickly secrete some insulin. Now, insulin gets to work immediately, commanding the cells to take up glucose as soon as it starts entering the bloodstream. Now when glucose enters the circulation, all the cells are prepared for it, and they quickly begin to take up small amounts of glucose. Thus there is only a relatively small rise in postprandial blood glucose, and no dehydration. Well, GLP-1 has finished its work. An enzyme in plasma, DPP-4, quickly metabolizes GLP-1 and puts an end to it. Now, as the rest of our meal gets digested, more and more glucose continues to enter the circulation. Some of this glucose reaches the pancreas and activates the beta cells directly at GLUT1 receptors. The beta cells realize we need more insulin. And so, more insulin is released. And all the cells take up glucose efficiently, under the influence of insulin. In a healthy body, all the organs are working perfectly. Let's take a look at the kidney too, who is doing his job perfectly. With the help of SGLT2 receptors, all the glucose that is filtered out is being reabsorbed into the blood. The kidney is making sure that no glucose is wasted by excreting in urine. Look at the liver, apart from taking up glucose and storing it for future use as glycogen, he also has glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis ready to occur at any time when the body is in need of glucose. Now, the doctor tells Jenny what problems are happening in her body. Insulin is, as usual, continuing its job of ensuring the uptake of glucose by the cells. While doing its supervision, it realizes that some of the cells are cutting slack. The cells are not taking up glucose properly, and they are not even afraid of insulin. These cells have developed insulin resistance. Now Jenny's plasma is overloaded with glucose because no cells are ready to take it up. And her poor kidneys. Glucose is overloaded in blood and the same blood goes to the kidneys. Now the kidneys also get overloaded. It's too much for them to handle and they are trying hard to reabsorb all the glucose but in vain. The kidneys are forced to excrete all the excess glucose through urine. The doctor's next step is to prescribe Jenny adequate medication to bring her blood glucose levels down as close to normal as she can. But how will she go about achieving this? Today doctors have a wide number of options at hand to help them achieve this. Here's some insight into our doctor's brain, as she considers all of the treatment options she has. So, here we have cells who are resisting insulin, and therefore not taking up blood glucose. The beta cells of the pancreas have tried their best, they have secreted as much insulin as possible to handle the amount of glucose in the blood, 
but it is just not enough. Let's try to solve this problem right from where it started, in the intestines. Now firstly, we can directly decrease the amount of glucose being produced in the intestine. If less glucose is produced in the intestine, lesser glucose will ultimately enter the circulation. For this we target the enzyme alpha-glucosidase, which was producing glucose from the bigger carbohydrates. This gives us our first class of oral hypoglycemic drugs. 1. Alpha-glucosidase inhibitors. They inhibit alpha-glucosidase in intestines, thereby decreasing glucose absorption in the gut. Next, as mentioned earlier, we have our faithful lookout GLP-1 in the intestine, who instantly rushes to warn everyone about the incoming glucose. What if we amplify this warning? There are two ways we can do this. 2. GLP-1 agonists. GLP-1-like molecules that directly stimulate the GLP-1 receptor of pancreatic beta cells, thereby producing more insulin. DPP-4 inhibitors. Inhibit enzyme DPP-4 which metabolizes GLP-1, thereby increasing the action time of GLP-1 in circulation. Our next problem is that our pancreatic beta cells are overworked and tired. We need someone to motivate them, to give them an extra push, to release more insulin to meet the body's demands. For this we have two classes of drugs, sulfonylureas, meglitinides. Both of them increase insulin release from beta cells. Moving on to the insulin-resistant cells in the body, who are putting up such a fight against insulin. Well, we know exactly how to deal with these stubborn guys. Thiazolidinediones. This class of drugs will definitely decrease their resistance and make them more cooperative. Now, we can go to the liver. Over here, we can send biguanides. They'll tell the liver to slow down glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis because there is already too much glucose to deal with. Lastly, we can make a quick stop at the kidney. Here we have the SGLT2 receptors who have been trying their best to absorb as much glucose as possible and prevent it from escaping out in the urine. SGLT2 receptor blockers. We'll tell them to take a break, go on a small vacation maybe. Because we need to get rid of as much glucose as possible through urine. So there you go, we have 8 possible classes of drugs that are at the doctor's disposal to treat Jenny's type 2 diabetes mellitus. And of course, our doctor will choose wisely.